Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to this regular, well, not so regularly scheduled meeting of uh, Wednesday, January 22nd. Uh, I'd like to first acknowledge that this meeting is taking place in the territory of the Coast Salish people. I'd like to welcome Alternate Director Goddard and Alternate Director Haim to the meeting today. Uh, I'd like to also note that this is a meeting that uh, should have taken place a week ago today. So therefore, um, we are uh, short a couple of uh, Electoral Area Services Committee meetings in, in January and February. So the items that will be discussed and, and approved today will be forwarded to the board meeting this afternoon. It's a little unusual, but uh, uh, because of the fact that we're short meetings and some of these are time sensitive, the uh, product of today's meetings will go directly to the board. Uh, I will note that under approval of the agenda, uh, we have three new business items, NB1, NB2, NB3, that will be uh, hopefully added to the agenda. And also for everyone to please note that under item R3, there are three items that we were going to be considering today engineering staff have asked that item three in that R3 be pulled from consideration. So with that information before you, I would ask for a motion to approve the amended agenda. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on those items? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Is there any opposed? There's none opposed, the motion carries. On to our first bit of business to the, for today, adoption of the minutes of our regular meeting, Ms. Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, item two, uh, that the Electoral Area Services Committee uh, meeting minutes of December 18th, 2019 be adopted. Moved by Director Smith, seconded by Director Yanni DiNardo. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor? If there are any opposed? Motion carries. Any business arising, Ms. Harrison? There is none. Next item on the agenda, item four, public input period. Is there anyone in our gallery today that would like to provide input to the committee on today's business? Please come forward to the lectern. There's a button on the microphone. Please speak into the microphone and you have three minutes. Welcome. Hi, uh, my name's Candy McNeil and I own property in uh, uh, CVRD area H. Uh, you're going to be reviewing a letter I sent in November and it's on your uh, agenda as C13 at the moment. My letter concerns a bylaw of the area H regarding separate suites. The bylaw directs that only owners will occupy one of the suites on the same parcel of land. And I have been told by three representatives of the CVRD that this bylaw is unenforceable because of its discriminatory nature and directs who shall live on the property. I respectfully ask that after reviewing my letter, the committee might ask the staff of the CVRD to find ways to remove this section of the bylaw. The reason I ask this particularly is that rental accommodation is extremely scarce in the area and the bylaw seeks to discourage the building of extra suites suitable for rental. And I believe this to be contrary to your stated aims. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to provide input to the committee today on items on our agenda? Seeing none, let's move forward through to our next item. We have no delegation, so that would bring us to correspondence. Ms. Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first item of correspondence is a grant and aid request for Electoral Area Sea Cobble Hill for Francis, Francis Kelsey's uh, dry grad. And the recommendation before you is that it be recommended to the board that a grant and aid Electoral Area C Cobble Hill in the amount of $200 be provided to Francis Kelsey School Dry Grad 
to support a safe and memorable dry grad party for the 2020 Francis Kelsey School Grads. Moved by Director Wilson, seconded by Director Yanni DiNardo. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Are there any opposed? None opposed, the motion carries. Ms. Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item two is a grant and aid request for electoral area D for the Couch and Bay Improvement Association and the recommendation before you is that it be recommended to the board that grant and aid electoral area D, Couch and Bay, in the amount of $500 be provided to Couch and Bay Improvement Association to support the Maritime Centre Vote <coughs> Festival. Moved by Director Yanni DiNardo, seconded by Director Kuhn. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed, the motion carries. Ms. Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item three is a grant and aid from Electoral Area D for the Cobble Hill Event Society. And the recommendation before you is that it be recommended to the board that a grant and aid Electoral Area D, Cowichan Bay, in the amount of $500, be provided to Cobble Hill Event Society to support Music in the Park 2020. Moved by Director Wilson, seconded by Director Yanni DiNardo. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Are there any opposed? There's none opposed. The motion carries. Ms. Harris. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item four is a grant and aid request from Electoral Area D for the Couch and Estuary Nature Center Society recommendation before you is that it be recommended to the board that a grant made electoral area D couch and bay in the amount of twenty two thousand five hundred dollars be provided to couch and estuary nature center society to support the children's program moved by director Yanni DiNardo seconded by director salmon any discussion seeing none all those in favor Are there any opposed none opposed the motion carries Ms. Harrison thank you mr. chair Item five is the grant and aid request from Electoral Area D, Couch and Bay, for the Couch and Secondary School. The recommendation before you is that it be recommended to the board that a grant and aid Electoral Area D, Couch and Bay, in the amount of $1,000, be provided to Couch and Secondary School for a bursary to a graduating student residing in Electoral Area D, Couch and Bay. Moved by Director Yanni DiNardo, seconded by Director Kuhn. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Are there any opposed? None opposed, the motion carries. Ms. Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item six is a grant and aid request, electoral area D, Couch and Bay, for the Duncan Couch and Chamber of Commerce. The recommendation before you is that it be recommended to the board that a grant and aid electoral area D, Couch and Bay, in the amount of $1,000 be provided to Duncan Couch and Chamber of Commerce to support the visitor servicing for the tourism, business, and attractions in Area D. Moved by Director Yanni DiNardo, seconded by Alternate Director Goddard. Any discussion? Se seeing it, Director Kuhn, you're, no? <laughs> He's holding his finger up. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? None opposed, the motion carries. Ms. Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item seven is a grant and aid request, electoral D Couch and Bay for Francis Kelsey 2020 Dry Garage Committee. The recommendation before you is that it be recommended to the board that a grant and aid electoral area D Couch and Bay in the amount of $200 be provided to Francis Kelsey 2020 Dry Grad Committee to support dry grad celebrations. Moved by Director Yanni DiNardo, seconded by Director Kuhn. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Are there any opposed? Seeing none opposed, the motion carries. Ms. Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item 8 is a grant and aid request from Electoral Area D, Couch and Bay, for Francis Kelsey School. The recommendation before you is that it be recommended to the board that a grant and aid Electoral Area D, Couch and Bay, in the amount of $1,000 be provided to Francis Kelsey School for a bursary for a graduating student residing in Electoral Area D, Couch and Bay. Moved by Director Yanni DiNardo, seconded by Director Smith. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Are there any opposed? None opposed, the motion carries. Ms. Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, item number nine is the grant and aid request for um, the Marine Rescue Society from Electoral Area D. 
the recommendation before you is that it be recommended to the board that a grant and aid electoral area D couch and bay in the amount of one thousand dollars be provided to Mill Bay Marine Rescue Society to support the replacement of the Marine Rescue Boathouse. Moved by Director Yanni Donardo, seconded by Director Kuhn. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Are there any opposed? There's none opposed. The motion carries. Yes. <laughs> yeah, she is. Ms. Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item 10 is a grant and aid request for electoral area E uh, for the Couch and Land Trust. The recommendation before you is that it be recommended to the board that a grant and aid electoral area E Couch and Station, Satlam Glenora, in the amount of $1,000 be provided to Couch and Land Trust to support education for youth on water conservation and riparian restoration in the Coke Silo watershed. Moved by Director Nicholson. Second, you're not moving. Would you like to speak to it? I need to make a change. Well, Director Nicholson. So apparently uh, the Couch and Estuary Nature Center Society is spun off from the Couch and Land Trust. So it needs to go to the Couch and Estuary Nature Center Society as per C4. How would we like to handle that, Ms. Harrison? Does this have to run back through finance or? Yeah, yeah I see finance nodding as well. Is this time sensitive? Can it be referred to the next meeting? It's not time sensitive, but what's what would be the issue of changing the? Uh, I gather everybody wants to make sure their I's are dotted and T's are crossed. I see a nod from that perspective, so move to refer this to the next meeting. Moved by Director Yanni DiNardo, seconded by Director Kuhn. Call the question, all in favor? Are there any opposed? None opposed, that motion carries. Ms. Harrison, next item. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item 11 is a grant and aid request, electoral area I, Yubomi Creek, for the First Lake Cowichan Scouts. And the recommendation before you is that it be recommended to the board that a grant and aid electoral area I, Yubomi Creek, in the amount of $500, be provided to First Lake Cowichan Scouts to support the purchase of first aid kits for the Scouts. Moved by Director Kuhn, seconded by alternate Director Goddard. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Are there any opposed? None opposed. The motion carries. C12. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, C12 is grant need request for electoral area I, Yubomi Creek, for the Cowichan School. And the recommendation before you is that it be recommended to the board that a grant need electoral area I, Yubomi Creek, in the amount of $500 be provided to Lake Couch and School to support the Lake Couch and School 2020 Dry Grad Celebration. Moved by Director Kuhn, seconded by Director Yanni DiNardo. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Are there any opposed? None opposed, the motion carries. And I think now might be an appropriate time to insert NB1, NB2, and NB3. Ms. Harrison? Okay. Um, item NB1 is a grant need request for electoral area C Cobble Hill. Recommendation before you is that it be recommended to the board meeting of January 22nd, 2020, that a grant need electoral area C Cobble Hill in the amount of $1,800 be provided to Mill Bay Marine Rescue Society to support the replacement of the Marine Rescue Boathouse. Moved by Director Wilson, seconded by Director Kuhn. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Are there any opposed? None opposed, the motion carries. Ms. Harrison, NB2. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Item NB2 is a grant and aid request from Area D, Saanich Inlet Protection Society. And the recommendation before you is that it be recommended to the board meeting of January 22nd, 2020, that a grant and aid electoral Area D, Couch and Bay in the amount of 500 be provided to Saanich Inlet Protection Society to support the Saanich Inlet Protection Society Roundtable on March 19th, 2020 in Mill Bay. Moved by Director Yanni DiNardo, seconded by Director Kuhn. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Are there any opposed? There's none opposed. The motion carries. NB3. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Item NB3 is a grant and aid request to electoral area F, Cowichan Lake South, Scott's Walls, for the Lake Cowichan School. And the recommendation before you is that it be recommended to the board meeting of January 22nd, 2020, that a grant and aid electoral area F, Cowichan Lake South, Scott's Falls, in the amount of $500, be provided to Lake Cowichan School to support the Lake Cowichan School 2020 Dry Grad Celebration. Moved by Director Yanni Donardo, seconded by Director Kuhn. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Are there any opposed? None opposed. The motion carries. On to C13, Ms. Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item C13 is a letter dated November 14th, 2019 from Candy McNeil regarding Area H zoning bylaw number 1020. And it's for information. So it's an information item. We've had the author of the letter uh, speak to us during the public input period. And uh, I could turn to the director for the area, perhaps the general manager. Uh, we'll go with alternate director Haim first. Thank you. Just a question through to staff. Um, is this a clause that's specific to area H or do other zoning bylaws have same or similar clauses? Ms. Charles. Microphone, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The clause that's found, or the regulation that's found in that bylaw, is, it's, it's a fairly common type of regulation that you'll see in bylaws. Uh, I'd like to say that um, for the benefit of the, the public who, who may be observing, and, and to Ms. Uh, McNeil, the uh, com community planning division is in the process of updating uh, modernizing the official uh, community plan for uh, the electoral areas and this will also um, trigger the need to update and harmonize and modernize the, the zoning regulations so as part of that process there will be a, a comprehensive review of regulations pertaining to suites um, and as part of that review we'll also have a, a, a legal a review a fulsome re legal review to ensure that they are in fact uh, lawful. Excellent. Any other discussion? Director seems to not have any further question. On to the next item. C14, Ms. Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, oh. Item C14 is an email dated December 12, 2019, uh, with regard to um, feedback on role and function of alternate electoral area directors. And again, that's for information. Uh, yeah, and I'll just uh, briefly mention, if you've uh, checked your emails, you should have had a reminder email from the ministry. Please uh, take the time to complete the, uh, the survey. It's very important. Uh, also, I, I would imagine that this will form part of the discussion at the electoral area workshop that's being held in Richmond uh, through the LGLA process in a couple of weeks. So uh, please do take the time. Uh, next items, we would be on number seven, and Ms. Harrison, IN1. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, item IN1, there are two items under that. Uh, both of these are for information. Uh, the first item is Electoral Area D, Couch and Bay Advisory Planning Commission Minutes of December 6, 2019. And the second item is Electoral Area E, Couch and Station, Satlam, Glenora, Advisory Planning Commission Minutes of November 12, 2019. Those items are for information. Any discussion on either of those? Seeing none, on to reports. Ms. Uh, I guess we have our one is Ms. Dixon will be presenting for this particular application. So, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Application before you is a development permit application for a subdivision. The subdivision proposes to split uh, one parcel into two, and the development permit is the uh, Shawnigan Lake Village Development Permit Area. The development permit um, guidelines specifically are the general regulations sorry, the general guidelines, the rainwater management guidelines, as well as the subdivision guidelines. 
As part of the application, the applicants have supplied a rainwater management plan as well as a landscape plan. The recommendation um, is option one, that the development permit be issued. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Any questions for staff first? Seeing no questions, turn to the alternate director for the area, Ms. Goddard. I would like to move the recommendation. Moved, or seconded by Director Salmon. Ms. Harrison, would you read the recommendation, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. The recommendation before you is that it be recommended to the board that development permit application number DP19B12 for parcel identifier 003-790-592 be issued. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? None opposed. The motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. R2, who will be presenting for us on this? Mr. McDonald. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there is no presentation, and you have a report in front of you, and I'm just here to answer any questions. Excellent. Do you have any questions for Mr. McDonald on this item? Director Nicholson. If you want to build on the floodplain below the 200 year flood, are there building options? Yes, the community charter um, regulates what requirements would be around building the floodplain, and we're currently experiencing an issue with somebody that um, had built in the past, and this policy is very restrictive, and there's no need for this policy to be restrictive anymore. We will be relying on geotechs. Any other questions for Mr. McDonald? There's a resolution in the package. Ms. Harrison, would you like to read it? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, re the recommendation before you is that it be recommended to the board that the building permits for Couch and Coke Sila floodplain policy 1994 be rescinded. Turn to Director Nicholson. We move the recommendation, seconded by Director Yanni DiNardo, any discussion on this item? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? None opposed. The motion carries. Next item, R3. Mr. Dennison, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Just to remind everyone, we'll be looking at two in this package, not three. Yeah. Um, so we have two applications or two recommendations for applications for the uh, Canada Infrastructure Program, uh, investing in Canada Infrastructure Program. First one is Saltaire, which we've applied for before, but we're unsuccessful. We've talked to the to the provincial staff, and they needed some better numbers on uh, our figures, the Class C estimates. So we're working on getting that together. Um, otherwise, that we the it was pretty positive feedback. So we think we've got a good chance of this one. It's critical infrastructure. We have to meet this new standards of 43210. And Saltaire is uh, one of our main utilities, uh, so we'd like to bring that forward. And then the second one is for, uh, again, another large utility in the south end, Shawnigan Beach Estate Sewer. And the idea here is uh, to both address the deficiencies of the sewer system, um, which are outstanding and difficult to deal with uh, because of the cost, and also provide servicing for the Shawnigan Village urban containment boundary, which uh, our planning friends uh, are very supportive of. So these are the two uh, best projects to bring forward, we believe, at this time. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff? Ms. Harrison, would you read the recommendations one and two, please? Or would you do them together? Sure. One and two, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the recommendations before you is that it be recommended to the board, number one, that a grant application to the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, Green Infrastructure, Environmental Quality Substream for the Saltair Water Treatment Expansion Project in Electoral Area G in the amount of $6,030,000 be submitted and that subject to grant approval up to a maximum of $1,608,201 uh, which is 26.67% in capital and operating reserves and short-term borrowing for Saltaire Water Treatment Expansion Project 
be approved and that the loan be paid back. Hold on, I got to turn the page. <laughs> Uh, that the loan be paid back over five years under the liabilities under agreement section 175 of the community charter. And two. Oh, sorry. And number two, that a grant application to the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program Green Infrastructure Environmental Quality Substream for the Shawnigan Wastewater Integration and Expansion Project in Electoral Area B an amount up to 10 million be submitted and that's subject to grant approval funding of up to 2,670,000, which is 26.67% through capital and operating reserves, connection fees from partners and new customers, and in short-term borrowing for the Shawnigan Wastewater Integration and Expansion Project be approved and that the loan be paid back over five years under the liabilities under agreement section 175 of the community charter. Do we have a mover? Moved by Director Smith, seconded by Director Yanni DiNardo. Any discussion on these two items? Seeing no hands, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? None opposed. Those two items are carried. Next item. R4. R4. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in the Yuba water system, uh, Cypress Road, we've been aware for some time that uh, we've got some uh, pipe there that's badly degrading, and we'd identified it for the asset management portion of the Community Works Fund of the latest round that we've received. And uh, it had been identified for year two. However, before in December, um, we had a major leak of that uh, pipe, and it was draining about a third of a reservoir a day. In Yubo, the, the, the um, the uh, material, the gravels are very coarse there, so the water disappears into the ground. We knew something was wrong, we just didn't know where it was. When finally we tracked it down to this piece of pipe, uh, did that repair, and then a little later, we had another two failures of that pipe. In fact, I've got a show and tell for you in a moment. Uh, so we would like to move that up to the 2020, or you know, to be done immediately under the program and the necessary amendments in the 2020 budget so that we're able to carry out that work as soon as possible. And here we have and a little show and tell, an example of what this pipe looks like. Um, so sometimes we, some of these things are pretty urgent. It's pretty bad. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's our recommendation, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Moved by June, seconded by Director Smith. Any discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? Is there any opposed? Motion carries. We didn't have that resolution read out, did we? No, you did not. That's Anybody okay. want the resolution read out? You're happy with that? Sorry, I'm dead. <laughs> R5. Yeah, it was. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. I'm here Dennison. for this report as well. Um, it's a little bit uh, convoluted, so bear with me. And it's typical of the kinds of, you know, things we do to try and solve some of the utility problems that we have out there. Um, so for our Burnham water system, uh, in the past we've had, we have two issues there ongoing. One is we've got uh, arsenic in the groundwater in some of our wells, and if that doesn't keep you up at night, I don't know what else would. Um, it certainly does keep us up at night. So we, we do treat it, but still, it's, it's pretty pretty scary thing to have that in the water supply. Second is that uh, there's a number of wells, but they're pretty limited in their capacity. So if anything goes wrong with any of them, we're, we're well short of water. In fact, we've had new levels of water restrictions there, which we call stage three extreme, uh, because we had very, very little water to work with. So we've been trying to address that problem, and it's tricky to do because you've got to identify a new location, you've got to have access, tenor over that land in some way or other, and a decent well that doesn't have, you know, that doesn't have uh, arsenic in it and provides sufficient water. So we've uh, finally, uh, there was one property owner that we've had a chat with, and they had developed a well um, that meets those requirements, provides uh, a decent amount of extra water for the system and doesn't have arsenic. Um, however, they're interested in a subdivision for their land uh, as part of the deal. They would only use a small portion of that water. Most of the, uh, of, the, of the water from the well would be for the system, for the whole community. So that seems like a win-win uh, a for both sides. Um, however, the property in question, uh, so to be serviced, they would have to be within the service area. And the OCP does not designate it as a property to be 
to be joined to the service area unless it's an emergent situation, is the way it's worded in the OCP. So we have discussed this with our colleagues in planning, and they are supportive of this kind of situation being an emergent situation. So we believe we have that supporting. The board has to designate it as such. So we need a recommendation from this committee to the board to have that in place so that we can then extend the servicing uh, or extend the service area to include this property. Further complicating the matter is immediately adjacent to this property is another property with a domestic well that is hydraulically, virtually 100% hydraulic, hydraulically connected to the first well. So if we draw in this well, their water supply drops off. So we've made an arrangement with them over a period of time, working this out, um, that they could be provided water by the service area if the impacts are too much on their, on their well. So they've agreed to this, but they too need to be included in the designation as part of this overall arrangement. So at this point, uh, we're bringing forward that recommendation uh, that these two properties be considered um, to, to be uh, in a situation where they need to be added to the designated serviceable areas under the OCP. Any questions for Mr. Dennison? Kind of complicated. Director Nicholson. So what do we know about the state of the aquifers in this area? Mr. Uh, Dennison. Yes, so the way we're thinking of this as far as we've talked to the um, to Flynn Rowe on how this would be handled. What we'd like to do is have kind of a um, an area license so that this wouldn't be adding more other than the two properties that are being added, that it doesn't add too much more burden to the system. So we'd, have, we'd be using our existing licensing capacity, but not, it's not intended for um, you know, great expansion. So it's not an additional burden on the, on the aquifer. We do know that uh, adjacent to this, of course, is the Coxilla aquifer, um, which is a very, you know, is a very serious situation. Um, our hydrogeology, we've drilled some uh, monitoring wells to make sure that it's not part of that, it's not part of the Coxilla, and we do, our hydrogeologist has done the assessments and everything else, and we've also included this additional information from the additional wells um, that we've uh, drilled for monitoring. So we believe it's not um, short of a very comprehensive, you know, very, very expensive study, which is being done over time in environment, but um, <coughs> we believe that it's, uh, it's reasonable at this point. Follow up. I'm really uncomfortable with this water, the water situation, in, in, as you know, um, and I'm, I'm just wondering whether you think we are going to be increasing the long-term risk regarding water supply in order to solve a short-term situation. Mr. Dennison. Well, it's hard to know without a lot of data. I mean, this question comes up in other locations, and you know, we, we need to do a lot of work on that. It's what we are under our new program planning to do. Um, but it's hard to have, it's hard to have very tangible um, answers for that at this time. Um, this short-term situation isn't a short-term in the sense that we have customers that need to have water. So um, the idea here is to displace some of the existing uh, wells that we're using now and use this well instead, so we get rid of the arsenic problem. Um, but to know exactly how the whole area is going to perform. We, we just don't know that at this point. And to do so will take years of data collecting and study for sure. Last question. I have a comment. It speaks to the need to maybe slow down. Can you wait until we get the uh, motion on the floor? Uh, just a quick question to you before I go to Director Salmon. Uh, what electoral area is this in? Oh, sorry, it's in Area B. Okay, thank you. Director Salmon. But how, how big is the Burnham system? So how many users? We have about 128, I think, connected. Okay. Is that stable? It's not growing, though? Is, that, is it growing? Is it? Um, it's pretty sta It's been stable since we've had it. Yeah. And one more? Follow up. The, the new well, how many gallons per minute? Um, it's rated at 18. Um, long-term sustainable yield. Um, we are down, as an interim measure, we have to downgrade it to 12 um, because of the impact on the adjacent property. So the arrangement that we um, came up with with the neighbors, they'd like to use their existing well, so we said, okay, why don't you do that? Um, keep using your well, and we'll monitor it as well, put some monitoring on it so you can see what the levels are looking like. And then as time goes on, if you want to join the water system, then we would be able to move to the 18 figure because it would no longer be a consideration. 
you. Director Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Denderson, um, 120 houses basically, or families basically, on the system at the moment. Correct. With, if the new subdivision that the, the um, applicant or the, where the new well will be got the go, go ahead for a new subdivision, how many extra would that add to the present load? So the, um, the property seeking subdivision, they're one lot now, so they're not in the service area, so that would be the original lot, and they're planning to go to at least three or four lots. They, they can, right now they can do three, they're trying to acquire a bit of a, a tiny bit short of four, uh, they'd like to do four, but whether they can or not, it's not certain. So three or four would be the answer that we're aware of at this time, and then the uh, adjoining property, if they join, would be another one as well. Follow up? Yeah, so if my math is correct, around about a 1% or 2% increase in the number of users, correct? Yep. Thank you. Director Yanni DiNardo, question for staff. Yes, uh, so they would be put in, this new subdivision would be put in the service area, and at that time that they're now hooked up, we are, we have, if they want to make, if they want to build more subdivisions or make, build more houses, we are, we have to give them the capacity there, no, they, Mr. Dennison, uh, this, this is just one property that would be joining the service area. So they have right. the rights for just, they would be then having rights for the, this one property they own. Right. They wouldn't have any other rights. No, the rest of the water is the system's water. Okay, so they, they want three or four lots on Correct. that one that we're adding into the service yes. area. Could they then come back to us once they're in the service area and request more? Not without rezoning. Okay, thank you. Turn to Ms. Uh, well, let's get on the floor first. Uh, turn to alternate director Goddard. Would you like to move this recommendation? I would like to move the recommendation. Do we have a seconder? Seconded by director Yanni Donardo. Ms. Harrison, would you please read this recommendation? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the recommendation before you is that it be recommended to the board that CVRD bylaw number 3707, Burnham <coughs> Water System Service Establishment Bylaw 2013, be amended to extend the boundary to include parcel identifiers 030265801 and parcel identifier 0063375330, pursuant to policy 20.1 of the South Cowichan OCB, OCP bylaw number 3510. Director Nicholson, comment on this item, please. Yeah, I just think we need to be thinking seriously about um, maybe freezing some of the developments that we are seeing when we have water concerns about our water supply um, until we have better information. And it, um, it's unfortunate that it's going to take so long to get better information, but it doesn't... I, I found this comment in this report um, a little bit unsettling um, that the... Um, That, it, that the zoning is a relic of the pre-South Couch and OCP period, and if the owners of the subject parcel wish to subdivide, they would be well advised to do so very soon. I don't think this is <laughs> how we should be making decisions about old, out-of-date rules uh, that allow people to do things that we know are not going to be helpful in the future um, from a perspective of water. So I think we need to you know, think about that as we move forward on more of these applications. Thank you. Call the question. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? None opposed. The motion carries. Ms. Harrison, oh, no, wouldn't it be you? Our six Environmental Services Division, South Couch and Liquid Waste. Who's presenting on that item? <clears throat> Welcome, Mr. Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, directors. I do have a handout, if I may provide that to the, the folks at the table here, and the handout is essentially the, uh, the slides that uh, I'll be covering here this morning. Go ahead.
Thank you, Mr. Chair, for this opportunity to report to you on the completion of stage one of the South Sector Liquid Waste Management Plan, uh, which we now refer to as the South Cowich and Liquid Waste Management Plan. And uh, it is an important milestone in, in our three-stage process. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge some of our, our key team members, uh, including uh, Kate Miller, Hamid Hatami, uh, Ann Cheryl, uh, Brian Dennison and other folks here uh, that are members of the, uh, the Land Use Services Group and our Utilities Group. I would also like to acknowledge uh, Dragon Rockich, uh, our consultant uh, who is the Senior Project Engineer uh, with us and uh, he is from, from McElhaney Consultants. Uh, also uh, uh, at this point acknowledging the, the folks from our Technical and Community Advisory Group uh, who uh, are, are a cross-section of, of folks from uh, provincial agencies uh, as well as our stewardship community, First Nations, and some of our utility providers. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge uh, folks from our steering group, uh, so directors for electoral areas A, B, and C, uh, all of whom have provided valuable input into this process. And as mentioned, uh, we are following this three-stage process, which is uh, this, the process established by the province for uh, developing liquid waste management plan amendments. Uh, it includes this, uh, this three-step, uh, three, 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 stage, three steps, which include uh, the identification of, of issues uh, and, uh, and solutions, uh, followed by implementation, and then ongoing uh, monitoring for effectiveness of the plan. Uh, at this stage, uh, we haven't included stormwater management uh, as part of the, the process. Uh, it is one of the things that the, the province is ultimately looking for, uh, but at this stage, due to bu budgeting constraints, we're, we're looking at that as, a, as something to be done in the future. So this, this project really began with developing an understanding of the problem that we have in the South Cowichan, which is that we have 25 individual community sewer systems and they don't have a coordinated strategy. The current plan is, is 22 years old uh, and it's out of date uh, and really what we have are several systems that are, have limited life left. Uh, they were developed uh, at the time to meet the needs of a specific development uh, and not take into consideration future needs and they're currently failing to, to meet the standards uh, that we currently have. And so the, the, the problem really is around how do we build the right infrastructure uh, in the right places and at the right time. And underlying this, this problem is the this, these, this situation that we're currently faced with, uh, again, which is that several of these sewer systems are failing to meet uh, regulations, and in particular, uh, the, the, the requirement for Class A effluent, which is uh, an alignment with our South Cowichan official community plan. Uh, we also recognize that the population is growing, and uh, we've, we've seen that in the, the population analysis that, uh, that we worked on as part of this first stage of work, uh, which, which noted that we have seen a 6% increase <coughs> in the population in the South Cowichan uh, between the, the two census periods, and that that's, that's higher than the regional average of, of approximately 4%. All the while recognizing that there's in this, this increase on impacts to the environment and we've been seeing that through some of the work that we've been working on uh, with the province through uh, water quality assessments in Shawnigan Lake, Shawnigan Creek, uh, tributaries into Saanich Inlet. Uh, so we've been seeing elevated nutrient levels uh, as well as uh, elevated E. coli levels in tributaries that are flowing into the lake. Uh, there's also a body of work uh, that we've, we've been uh, it's been put together showing uh, that uh, uh, fecal inputs into these creeks as well as Saanich Inlet have contributed to this ongoing closure of shellfish harvesting uh, in Saanich Inlet. And so uh, recognizing that, that the impacts that we're seeing are very much watershed based, that the plan area that was established was also watershed based and it, it includes these three key watershed areas in the South Cowichan, uh, the Shawnigan Creek watershed, uh, the Satellite Channel benchlands as well as the Mal Malahat benchlands. Uh, it's home to three communities including Shawnigan Lake, Cobble Hill and Mill Bay as well as three First Nations communities. Pocquichan First Nation uh, at uh, Hatch Point Reserve uh, near Arbutus Ridge, as well as Malahat Nation and Cowichan tribes have traditional territory overlapping the, the plan area as well. 
And as mentioned, uh, one of the key data sets that we worked with was uh, an understanding of, of the, the current population growth that we've seen in the, in the South Cowichan, but also the projections going forward. And, and the projections are important uh, not only because they, they establish the requirements for infrastructure options, so knowing uh, what, uh, what, uh, what capacity they need to, to be considering, uh, but also supporting the phasing of options. So we'll talk a little bit about that in terms of uh, the potential for, for building in that, that phasing of, of options that will get us only so far into the future and then the ones that will really carry us out for the long term. Uh, all the while recognizing that uh, we need to go back every five years and, and test the assumptions of those population projections uh, to see if we're on track with, with where we had originally uh, anticipated. And so with that, uh, there were two scenarios that were, were primarily focused on as part of this work. Uh, one was essentially a business as usual scenario where we saw continued growth uh, that we've seen in the South Cowichan uh, to expected to continue out to 2050. Uh, and, and another situation uh, where we would have more focused development in our urban containment boundaries, uh, up to 75% growth. And, uh, and that would allow that, uh, that benefit of having uh, an opportunity for increased support for community infrastructure. Uh, so uh, layered on top of the population projections, we also have uh, this important data set, which is our current uh, liquid waste systems inventory. And so again, we have 25 community sewer treatment systems, uh, 11 are privately operated, uh, 10 by the CVRD, and for our school district systems. Uh, we also have uh, a number of permits uh, through the Ministry of Environment for composting, food processing, and vehicle dismantling processes. And so the, the objectives that were set out in the beginning of this process for, for infrastructure options, uh, one of the key ones that, that uh, was established was that all of the options that would be considered uh, would have Class A effluent standards. And, and what that really means is that they include advanced treatment uh, with not only disinfection, so disinfection being uh, the eradication of, uh, of microorganisms that can cause disease, uh, as well as having uh, nitrogen reduction capabilities. And these are the, so Class A is the most uh, strict uh, standard and requirements that, uh, that are, are, are available and uh, that are required to be met. And so the, the options must also uh, consider full growth requirements uh, and uh, the opportunity for expandability to, out to, to 2050. That was another key uh, objective. Uh, and be able to provide that coverage for all of our urban containment boundaries. So currently we don't have that coverage, but we needed that uh, going forward. Uh, and ultimately be able to protect our receiving environments. Uh, and that includes uh, surface water uh, bodies such as Shawnigan Lake and our creeks and tributaries throughout the watersheds, uh, as well as Saanich Inlet and groundwater uh, also being a key receiving environment uh, that needs to be protected in, in throughout the, uh, the, the plan area. And so uh, at the beginning of the process, a long list of, of options were evaluated as part of this stage one process. And uh, that's included in the information package in terms of the coverage of those options and uh, the various locations of, of treatment plant facilities. Now that long list of options was, was processed through a, an evaluation process, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but first, uh, to highlight to you uh, some of the, the key steps in the process, the milestones that uh, that were accomplished as part of this stage one. So again, that definition of the problem statement, uh, the development of a long list of options, evaluation of those options, and then finally being able to arrive at a, a short list of options that we carry forward to into stage two. And we'll take a look at that uh, in a moment. Uh, underlying that process, we had some key consultation steps. Again, uh, our project team providing key input, uh, as well as the, the, the steering group made up of, of the directors. Uh, and our technical community advisory group throughout that process uh, with a number of, of opportunities to get, uh, to get their feedback. Uh, we had the opportunity to meet with First Nations staff uh, from our key First Nations partners and we're expecting to have uh, ongoing discussions uh, with them throughout uh, the, the subsequent stages of the process. 
In November, we had um, a couple um, opportunities to engage with the public. Uh, we had a, a public meeting uh, in the South Cowichan, and we had approximately 30 people uh, join us and provide uh, their input on both the criteria and the, the long list of options, as well as uh, uh, an online opportunity for feedback through, through PlaySpeak and, and other forums uh, that, uh, that folks uh, felt uh, they, could, they could use to, to get uh, information to us. And so again, uh, the evaluation criteria that, uh, that were part of this process uh, included these, these high-level categories of, of financial, technical, social, and environmental. And uh, ultimately, it was through the, the work of our technical and community advisory group, uh, as well as receiving input from our, our joint uh, uh, advisory planning committee meetings for electoral areas A, B, and C, where we were able to get some input on these criteria and understand what the weightings should be. So uh, what the relative weightings of each of these categories should be as we consider the various, various options. And uh, once, we, once we landed on what, what those weightings should be, and we'd gone through this process of, of evaluating, are these the right criteria that allow us to evaluate whether the options meet the objectives, uh, and, and being able to, to fine tune and remove any potential duplication, uh, we were able to, to go from there uh, with these evaluation criteria and uh, really refine it down to a shorter list of options. So to move from uh, 28 options down to 14 options that we could move forward with into stage two. And, and ultimately that meant having uh, six that we can go forward with and evaluate for Mill Bay, five for Shawnigan Lake, and three for Cobble Hill. And so uh, there's still more work to be done, but in a rough sense, uh, what does that look like in terms of, of where we are today? And so, uh, again, we, we looked at this opportunity to break the, the options down into phases. And so when we look at uh, this first phase, if you will, of options that can get us to full build out uh, to 2040, uh, we focus on these urban containment boundaries. So what are the options that are, are within those, those village uh, core areas uh, that support growth in areas that are already designated for, for higher density, uh, but uh, could be potentially more expensive uh, if we don't consider some of the benefits that could have, uh, could be obtained by combining some of these communities, which we'll, we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, essentially, when we looked at the, the Mill Bay options, uh, they focused around uh, the, the treatment plant locations uh, in the, that are there in the village core, uh, with the Mill Springs option uh, being the one that has the, the current uh, highest level of capacity going forward. Uh, in Shawnigan Lake, uh, it was looking at the treatment plant location options for um, uh, Shawnigan Beach Estates, uh, as well as uh, a potential option in Shawnigan Village and for Cobble Hill, it looked at a treatment plant location that is the current one uh, for 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 Cobble Hill Village uh, at the Twin Cedars uh, site, as well as having Arbutus uh, Ridge uh, continue uh, to 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 go along. All the while recognizing that there's a need for all of these systems to rise to meet that level of Class A effluent standard, and all the while recognizing that uh, going forward into the next stage of work, there's opportunities for partnership. Uh, with our key First Nations groups, uh, with, with Malahat Nation in, uh, in Area A and Pakwachin First Nation uh, next to Arbutus Ridge in, in Area C. And so when we look at uh, the options uh, for, for the longer term into Phase 1 and Phase 2 uh, and recognizing uh, that continued population growth out to, to 2050, uh, there's this opportunity to, to link the communities. And so uh, what does that look like uh, when we have uh, an opportunity to, to have um, connections between Cobble Hill and Shawnigan Lake and then Shawnigan Lake and, and Mill Bay? And so uh, this, this considers these, these, these potential benefits for, for shared cost of, of infrastructure uh, and additional opportunities to reduce uh, loading of contaminants onto the receiving environment. <clears throat> All the while, recognizing that this is not in any way preempting where our urban containment boundaries should be drawn in the future. <clears throat> it's recognizing that uh, there are opportunities for, for potential additional connections between uh, the, the current uh, core village areas and, uh, and those corridors that are, that are highlighted in, in, the, in the darker color uh, between the, the various villages. And so uh, understanding that uh, the, the long-range plan 
is, is this, uh, this tool, if you will, of addressing our current problem that we have in the South Cowich. And it provides that, that roadmap and it allows us to uh, test not only the scenarios that, uh, that are in place, but if something else emerges, if we see uh, something come along in the future um, in terms of <clears throat> some surface water quality uh, problems, for example, or groundwater quality programs, that we can go back and, uh, and build in some, some additional scenarios and be adaptive to those, those particular issues as they emerge. But recognizing that, uh, that we have this plan and, and once it's signed off by the province, and that's, that's uh, part of the next stages of work, uh, that that really does um, uh, help us move forward with that, uh, that support from the community and, and can uh, reduce the need for uh, referendums or AAPs going forward uh, that need to be established. This, this plan is a regulatory plan and it gives us that, that assent to go forward. It also provides us uh, with a key opportunity to backstop uh, grant applications going forward. And uh, one, of, one of the examples of that is the, the grant application opportunity uh, for uh, uh, improving uh, community sewer infrastructure in the Shawnigan Lake uh, Village area. And so uh, right now, one of the options was to uh, look at expanding and uh, bringing and, and, and fixing the current uh, problem uh, by fixing the, the site itself. Uh, but in fact, uh, if we look at the plan a little bit closer, we can see that that option of, of being able to provide that linkage between uh, Shawnigan Lake and Mill Bay uh, turns out to be a, a more cost-effective way of being able to, to manage liquid waste, uh, not only in uh, Shawnigan Lake, but also for, for Mill Bay by having uh, shared costs between uh, more than, more than uh, one community, having, having those two communities be able to partner to, uh, to reduce the costs overall and ultimately uh, reduce impacts on the, the receiving environment. And so to go back and, and just think about uh, where we're going uh, with our master planning process, uh, we, we've, we've, we're at the end of this, this stage one process. Uh, we've completed that uh, development of a short list of options. Uh, going forward, uh, we, will, we, we will be moving into to stage two, uh, which is ultimately the, the development of a preferred option, and ultimately stage three, which com includes this detailed engineering and cost analysis. Uh, parallel to this, um, we, all, we have the, the Mill Bay and Cobble Hill sewer integration programs, and uh, that program has already made significant progress as well, and it, it's, um, it's an integrated process uh, being led through our utilities group, and uh, they're on, well on their way to identifying who are some candidates for inclusion in a, in a community sewer system uh, in, the, in the Mill Bay area, but also having made some significant steps for uh, Cobble Hill sewer integration. And the ideal scenario would have been to have uh, the master planning process complete before starting uh, a Mill Bay Cobble Hill sewer integration program. But because of the grant opportunity was, that was there at the time, uh, we recognized the need to be adaptive. And so what, uh, what that meant was that a lot of the base work that was done as part of the master planning process uh, really established us uh, for being able to, to move forward with the Mill Bay Cobble Hill sewer integration program in an efficient way. Really a lot of that, uh, that uh, important information around population projections and uh, policy analysis uh, was able to be leveraged into uh, the, uh, the Mill Bay Cobble Hill Sewer Integration Program. So the next stages of work uh, in the process uh, for, for stage two are highlighted by this, 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 this process of refining the short list of options uh, that were developed in stage one and uh, having the, the technical and community advisory group uh, review of those, those options uh, and being able to come out of that uh, with a preferred option for detailed uh, engineering cost analysis in stage three, uh, as well as ongoing uh, consultation and review of, of that preferred option, and ultimately ending with uh, submit, submittal to the uh, minister for review of the liquid waste management plan, uh, and the hope that we can combine these two <coughs> stages uh, for, for additional efficiencies uh, in the process going forward. And so with that, uh, thank you for your time, and if there are any questions, we'd be glad to uh, address those. I'm just going to make a speaker's list. Anybody interested? Oh, goodness. We'll see. 
And I've got myself on the top of the list. So uh, just a couple of quick questions for you. Uh, I, I'm, would I be correct in assuming that the ANOVA report was sort of foundational to s some of the work that was done here? And in, in, uh, it looks like you're going in, in the direction of a lot of the recommendations within that report. Sorry, if I may clarify, um, I'll ask uh, Ms. Miller to speak to that. Thank you. The, the ANOVA report, and I, I would defer to Mr. Dennison and Mr. Tammy for specifics on that report, but the ANOVA <laughs> report, uh, from my perspective, really focused on the CVRD uh, utilities operations and, and issues uh, within that particular group. The liquid waste management plan is something which is uh, a provincial requirement uh, for facilities over a certain amount, and so it's it's separate. We drew information from the ANOVA report, but it did not drive it, and so the plan itself is 1989, so uh, many years out of date. Uh, typically, they're redone on a fairly frequent basis, uh, at least once every 10 years. They're, they're assessed for needed updates, uh, so we've gone back to, to the provincial process as opposed to relying on our own internal knowledge. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I just, the, the reason I brought up the ANOVA report, it just seemed like there were some very familiar threads from that report that, that seemed to manifest in this. So just two quick questions. Uh, in, in regards to uh, a concern raised by Director Nicholson, uh, is, is aquifer recharge and, and like purple pipe concepts and all of that, are they all part of the considerations of this? And I'll, I'll, my second question in that, is there a benefit to the fact that we've got electoral areas that are the, the these, this report is covering electoral areas and, and the governance is just within electoral areas. There isn't a, a municipal partner involved. So two questions, the aquifer recharge purple pipe and secondly on governance is, is there a benefit to the fact that we're, uh, we're just electoral areas for the plan area coverage? So to, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may speak to the, the first part initially, uh, most definitely the, the aquifer um, recharge as well as understanding of um, the, the potential for any uh, additional uh, contamination of, of groundwater uh, as a result of, 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 of future um, uh, loading is, is key to this process and understanding that, that, that problem. Uh, there's a growing uh, body of work that we have to, to understand uh, both groundwater quality and uh, groundwater supply in the South Cowichan. So both of those pieces are key uh, that look at um, nutrient levels uh, in, the, in the aquifer, uh, but also uh, looking at uh, groundwater supply stress, knowing, uh, and that, that's a body of work that we have in hand that, that gives us a very strong indication of uh, that, that our, our ground, our aquifers are, are stressed in the South Cowichan. Uh, and, and that was why that the evaluation criteria, uh, we had some significant weighting on the, uh, the impacts to the receiving environment uh, in that uh, environmental category of our evaluation criteria uh, to be able to understand uh, what ultimately is that benefit of reducing uh, loading of, of our receiving environments and understanding the, the various uh, the various benefits uh, of our options. Uh, in terms of, of jurisdiction, in terms of how uh, it would differ if, if we had a municipal partner, um, we have uh, a process in, in the central sector as well that has a municipal partner. Uh, I can invite others to, to speak to that as well. Um, we, we have, as I mentioned, we have a steering group that includes our elected officials for areas A, B, and C, and, and we receive valuable input through, through that process. Um, there are processes that can be in place when we do have municipal partners as well. I'll invite others to speak. Mr. Dennison? Yes, if I may, Mr. Chairman, just a quick note. Uh, so for our Cobble Hill project, we'll be doubling 
our reuse of effluent there, which we already do to a very large extent. We, we in fact, we can't keep up with demand. We, we use up our effluent before we meet the full demand. So we're in, in this project that we're doing now, we're doubling that capacity and, and hope to see a lot more, which actually puts Cobble Hill right at the forefront of all communities around, right? We're, we're cutting edge there. And then similarly with our Mill Bay project, we'll be uh, displacing some of the demand on Mill Bay Waterworks. Potable water is used for irrigation now will be uh, providing pipe, purple pipe for that as well, and looking for uh, some other opportunities, which we're kind of going through right now, is to try and find out where we can maximize opportunities for use of the effluent, as well as definitely recharging the aquifer at the same time. So we're on it. Excellent. So I'll just review the speakers list. I've got Director Yanni Donardo, Salmon, Wilson, and Smith. Anyone else? Director Yanni Donardo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you to Keith, I really appreciate this. Um, thank you for a good report and um, working with your team. I think this has come a long way um, from all the years that I've sat at this table and I do see threads of the ANOVA report myself personally. I like the fact that the technical community advisory group has, you know, and then you've also <coughs> shared that and has been really valuable and everybody working together and uh, your report was very well written and also very well um, given to us today that you know it's, it's easy to follow it's you know makes sense and I like to see that we're moving together as a broader community we don't have bits and pieces everywhere and we're really evolving so I really appreciate you and your team on this it's it was well done director salmon no, thank you Keith for the report and I just say lots of moving parts pieces um, Question, two questions really, but that slide you had, the benefits of the long range plan, um, I was happy to see that because I, yeah, I think it's after that. There we go. I was just curious, so this, this isn't, uh, this whole process is formal, is this formally mandated by the province or is this more of a nice to have that has some benefits like the, we won't need to do referendums if we get it through? That's my, my first question. I know it could just, I mean, we have the, the six million for Mill Bay that we've got without this plan. And I see today we did the 10 million for Sean again without this plan. So how does that all work? Mr. Lawrence. And again, I'm gonna invite Ms. Miller to speak to that because there is a bit of history to, to that. And, uh, but yes, it is uh, something that uh, we're required to do in short, but uh, for additional detail or background, I'll invite uh, Ms. Miller to, to provide that. Uh, thank you, yes, uh, a great question. Um, uh, it is a mandatory process to have a liquid waste management plan when you have uh, facilities uh, of this nature, uh, and particularly when you've got growth uh, that we've seen here, which is what the driver in terms of updating the plan are. So while I said 10 <coughs> years, it's, it's really around what's your growth profile and how often do you need to update the plan. Uh, in this region, we've got official community plans. They're, they're, they're expected of local government and they're maintained and, and kept um, abreast of current conditions on the same cycle as a, a liquid waste master plan would be. So yes, you can have communities without uh, OCPs and you can have uh, sewage treatment facilities of a small nature without a liquid waste management plan, but it behooves us to really think ahead, particularly when you start looking at some of the cost of these facilities to operate and the requirements to have functional facilities to actually support the growth that our communities are experiencing and project. Follow up. Thank you. So just to take the <coughs> example, Mill Bay that I think we approved today to apply for that 10 million. So are we, are we doing the roughly half the cost option or are we applying for the full cost option? Uh, thank Ms. you. We're, we're applying for the full cost option. We're still working out some of the details. For this particular one, it was a, an example of we could spend up to $10 million, uh, putting money into just one small facility, which didn't increase the opportunity for expanded services. 
versus looking at linking in and tying into the Mill Bay facility, which would uh, presumably, and certainly the early numbers indicate that that capacity would be able to provide sewage treatment uh, capacity to the entirety of the uh, Shawnigan Village containment zone at a lower or equitable cost uh, that was initially intended to be used for just the Shawnigan Beach Estates facility upgrades. So it's a, it's a value add, it's an expansion of services, and falls in line with the master plan objectives. One of the things about the value of a master plan when you're, when you're looking at a grant application, particularly of this value, is that the funder wants to know, do you have a strategy to maintain this infrastructure over time? Do you have a good business model that will stop you from coming back to us repeatedly asking for grant money to upgrade your facilities and to maintain them? Do you have a strategy to do that internally? We'll help you get to that point, but we expect you to maintain maintain and operate your facilities sustainably as a community going forward. So that's the value of the master plan and, and the business argument behind it. Thank you, Ms. Miller. And I just want to interject briefly. I love it when we can get the word behooves into a meeting. And uh, it behooves me to remind everyone that uh, our next meeting starts at 11. We have some significant closed session items. So I'd just like to ask everyone to be succinct to the uh, to the item on the floor so that we can. Uh, I, I don't think we want to come back to EASC after, uh, after the rest of the meetings that we have today. So uh, with that, I will go to Director Wilson. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You just stole my thunder because I was going to use behooves as well. <laughs> so, um, first of all, thank you, Mr. Denison. Yay for Cobble Hill. Good stuff. Thank you. Um, the urban containment boundaries um, that were shown on the on the diagrams just now, they are as they exist right now? So, yes, these are the urban containment boundaries for electoral areas A, B, and C. Okay, thank you. And follow-up, please? Yep. Um, Class A standards that we're talking about, these, and you mentioned these are the, they are the highest uh, available there. Um, they, and you also spoke about the nitrogen, sorry, I'm no communist chemist here, nitrogen reduction. Um, does this, is, it, is nitrogen the same as the nitrates and nitrites? And, and in class A, how much of reduction would there be in the nitrates and nitrites? Mr. Lawrence, can you tackle that one? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in, indeed, the, there is a requirement uh, under Class A for, for nitrogen reduction. I don't have the numbers in front of me in terms of what it specifically is, but I'll invite uh, uh, Mr. Dennison forward, who has a bit more detail to share. Uh, so the Class A standard has a, nitri a nitrate limit of 10 milligrams per liter, which is the same as the drinking water limit. So the idea is, is that you would reduce the effluent discharge to within the same figure that is a drinking water. Almost always when it's in the ground, it gets diluted further, but at least that's the standard. Nitrate is not, nitrite is not indicated in the standards, but nitrite is a temporary, in the way organisms degrade organic matter and ultimately produce nitrate, nitrite is only of a very small quantity briefly and then it's converted very quickly. So they don't really bother with that as a standard because it's an interim chemical. Final follow-up. Uh, so if I understand it correctly then, um, the class A will reduce these two, uh, the nitrates and nitrites, within the system that is used. Correct. Uh, the treatment itself provides that reduction, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, next, uh, Director Smith. Thank you. Through the chair to staff, I wouldn't, we seem to have missed something in regards to water. I th believe that sewer systems require a fair amount of water to go through the system as it works. Is there, um, in this plan, I didn't really see anything where it indicated where the water would be coming from, and I know that through those areas there's quite a bit of stress uh, regarding water, so I was just wondering if you could clarify that for me. Mr. Lawrence. Uh, so I'll, I'll start off with a, a response and invite others to, to contribute as well in terms of uh, the technical requirements for, for water. Uh, but uh, essentially, when we looked at the various Can options... Can you hang on for a sec? Yeah. Director Wilson. Thank you. 
Mr. Uh, Lawrence? We did include uh, in those evaluation criteria the, the impacts to the environment uh, in the various uh, uh, evaluation of those options, uh, and that includes uh, impacts to our water resources. Uh, but in terms of the specifics around uh, water requirements for, for the various systems, uh, that's something that will be also evaluated in more detail in the subsequent stages of work uh, in terms of, of how these systems uh, will actually, uh, could actually potentially function. We'll have more detailed analysis of, of those options. And ultimately in stage three, uh, that will include uh, a detailed analysis and design that will, will tell us uh, specifically how the system needs to operate. Uh, if there's more to add to that uh, question, I invite uh, uh, either Ms. Miller or Mr. Hatami to, to join in. Ms. Miller. So, thank you. Sorry for, for creeping up behind Good. you. I, I apologize. So, uh, so to be clear, in a, in a perfect world, you would do both your, your water supply analysis and infrastructure needs at the same time as your sewage treatment and uh, collection assessment. We, we haven't done that to date. We haven't had the opportunity to do that. Um, and as we go forward, we'll be looking as we, as we look at stage two and stage three, three of this process, the specifics with regards to uh, sewage treatment and the impact on the natural environment. Uh, the, the, the piece of work that we won't be doing is the, the impact on water resources. Uh, at this point, we're, we're assuming that we're not providing an integrated water delivery service in this particular area, that the, the origins of the water are at source of, of use, whether it's people have private wells and they've got uh, hooked up for sewage or they're ex part of an existing um, uh, water distribution network. The focus on this particular one is the reality that uh, when you treat sewage, you've got three options. You can put it into a surface water body, you can put it to ground, or you can put it into a marine environment. And so the focus here has been on the protection of the limited water resources that we have, uh, the strategy that it's currently in, in, uh, in more detailed assessment at this point is if we're linking Sean again, which does have uh, water resources to Mill Bay, then there is a possible uh, potential for uh, reinjection of uh, water into the Mill Bay aquifer, which is limited capacity. But certainly the environmental impact assessment of that piece of work is currently ongoing. So that's the, the scope of what we're looking at in terms of water supply at this point for this particular study. Director Nicholson. Thank you. Um, urban containment boundaries, how do we determine those, where they're going to be? Uh, it's, I guess that's a planning question. Uh, Ms. Trulf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we currently have urban contain, containment boundaries, boundaries, which were established um, through the oh, South Couch goodness. and Official Community Plan process, and those will, um, as official community plans are reviewed, be reviewed and can be amended over time, but essentially they come through a community planning process. Follow up. Right, so we're not, uh, I suspect that water didn't play a big, water supply um, and the environment probably didn't play a big role in determining our current urban containment boundaries. And I think what we need to be prepared to do when we go out and do public consultations. Well, first of all, Keith, I thought you did a good job. This is a great report. But as we move into this next phase where we, we're we going to go out and talk to the public more on consultation, we should be setting people up to understand that the way we have been developing may have to change because there are so many unknowns on the waterfront. And so um, while this is a, a really good approach, Things are going to have to be tweaked because there's just so many unknowns and it's going to take us a while to get that information. And so this is an opportunity for us to do that setup as we go out. Just as it's an opportunity as we do this har uh, harmonization workshops in the next little while, uh, you know, to do that as well. So I, um, I think we really need to pay close attention to that kind of thing. Uh, Thank you, and I, I think that's a, a perfect transition into the fact that uh, we need to uh, tackle our corporate uh, strategic planning process for electoral areas and, and what message and what work that we plan to be doing in the uh, remaining less than three years in this term. And uh, uh, with that, I want to 
thank Mr. Lawrence and the team for putting together a very good package. I'm going to end with one note. Um, my eyes are still in pretty good shape, but there's a couple of those slides that were darn near impossible to read, so I don't know what you can do to improve that for us, but uh, that would be appreciated if you could. So with that, thank you very much, Mr. Lawrence and team. Uh, very good job. Uh, back to our agenda. <coughs> Ms. Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Unfinished business items, there are none. Correct. <clears throat> and the new business we've tackled, I gather. And, <clears throat> excuse me, NB1, 2, and 3 were dealt with under reports. Is there anyone in the gallery that would like to pose a question to the chair on items on the agenda? Seeing none, Ms. Harrison, I believe we need to resolve into closed session. Uh, so could I have a motion that the meeting be closed in accordance with Community Charter Part 4, Division 3, Section 90, as noted below? Director Kuhn moves. Do you have a seconder? Director Nicholson, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Re uh, regroup here for closed at 1030.